uh, here. This is the list they came up with. So what do they leave out? What do they leave out? If you were if if you were doing this, what do you think they left out? It should be there. Um, well, I guess just by the rest of the um, Constitution, like I would say, the Fourteenth Amendment today that we have is pretty important. Like that's something I think. And when you think. say the Fourteenth Amendment, you mean? Uh, well, I'd say the due. Due process clause. Okay, Chris, we have a due process. The Fifth Amendment due process clause applies to the federal government. The Fourteenth Amendment due process clause applies to the state governments. So what you might be saying is we need protection against the states and not just protection against the federal government. Madison thought that. He proposed that a, an amendment that would guarantee the right of freedom of religion, Trial by jury and press would be, would, those were the things important enough that they would actually impose that on the states. Uh, it lost by a very narrow margin. And the theory was, hey, we're writing a new federal constitution. Let's not you know, fool around with the states. That's not what we're doing here. Leave the states alone. Let's, you know, let, let's work on what the federal constitution can do. Another thing you might be thinking about with the 14th Amendment is equal protection, which is an idea of equality. You don't, there, there certainly was uh, a lot of concern about equality of a sort um, at the founding, but there's one big glaring thing out there, which is slavery, of course. And they couldn't do anything about slavery. There would not been, there, I mean, there would have been no union. So the, those who are against slavery, like Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin, uh, are forced to choose. Are we going to have a union? Or are we not? Or, and, and, and they went with the union with slavery in the hope that eventually something would happen. At the time, even a lot of Southerners believed that slavery would actually go away peacefully. And the reason that was not an unreasonable view for them at the time was that the cotton gin had not yet been invented. At this time, yes, there was slavery. It was in the, the basic products were, were uh, uh, tobacco, tobacco being the big one, but indigo and rice. This is small potatoes compared to cotton, which is like the Silicon Valley of, you know, of the mid 19th century. Once the cotton gin was invented, slavery became much more important and embedded in the economic life of the South. And so uh, at, the, at this time, forming a union where you allowed slavery didn't look like you were forming a union where slavery was gonna exist forever. But slavery is certainly, so I think the first thing you might think about is, you know, what's missing in dealing with slavery is something that's missing. What else is missing? What's missing? What would you add if you could add? Right to wear a hat? No, probably equal pay for equal work. So equal pay for equal work. Um, comment about this. So if your employer is private, then that is actually, so is that a natural right? No, but it was something I would like to be included. Yeah, yeah. So, but it does, so, but it raises, it raises a deep philosophical question about what is the nature of rights. Are we talking about rights against the state? negative rights, that the things that the government cannot do to you, or, or whether we're talking about regular uh, uh, economic uh, rights to be asserted against some other private person, in which case we're actually going to the government and asking the government to do something to protect us against some other person. Um, arguably, the Constitution already includes that, 
in the, insofar as it gives the government the power to regulate commerce. If employment is commerce, we've actually sort of dealt with your problem, but it's not constitutionalized. It's left to uh, statute. Just look, one more person. What, what might be something else to be added? Yes. I would add a sort of Ninth Amendment provision that would say that we have many rights, uh, that we can't enumerate them all, and that they uh, shan't be infringed either. So you'd like a catch-all. Right. Correct. And, and so the Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution should not be taken to deny or disparage other rights which are retained by the people. Uh, what does that mean? Deny or disparage, what are they? Okay, well, let's not deny or disparage them, but what is their legal status? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> well, are they cons fully constitutional rights like the First Amendment? even though they weren't mentioned? Oh, I, I, I think I see where you're going. Um, well, they, they may or may not be natural rights or, or deriving from natural rights. Uh, it, it's just sort of a, uh, a provision that mm -hmm. suggests that we all have uh, negative mm -hmm. freedoms mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it should and do we think that uh, five unelected judges should have sort of unbridled authority to decide what those things are going to be? So for example, the Supreme Court has held that we have a constitutional right against capital punishment for rape. Did the judges have the authority to decide that? Do you think under the Ninth Amendment? Who should decide? I mean, rights are controversial sometimes, I, right? I think... Who decides? You know, personally, I, I think that should be an issue of democracy and, and something like that, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you should have capital punishment. So when the Ninth Amendment says that other rights may exist and they're not being denied or disparaged, you might say, well, they're just being left however they were before. Remember, Hamilton was worried that they're made worse off, that the enumeration of some is actually going to be to eliminate the others because of the exclusio unius principle. Maybe what the Ninth Amendment is just saying is all these other things, we're just leaving them where they were. Uh, there are lots of common law rights, there are lots of statutory rights, there are lots of, lots of sources of rights other than just the Constitution and we're not taking any of them away. But that's a great, uh, I think that if we had time, you know, the Ninth Amendment is a really rewarding thing to think about in terms of, of you know, both the substance of rights but also the procedures for identifying and enforcing them. And, and it presents lots of interesting hard problems. So they, did they include any that should have been left out? Did they make any over-inclusion? That can be a problem. Anybody have a candidate for a, a right they should not have included? What do you think? Yes, I see a hand. The Second Amendment. So gun, gun rights are the obvious choice, right? I mean, I mean, we might disagree. Lots of people think it was not a mistake, but lots of people think it was. It's probably the most controversial. Although note that aspects of capital punishment law are very controversial. The protection for freedom of property is very, uh, is potentially controversial. And today, especially among, and you know this better than I do, especially among young people, Freedom of speech is becoming, uh, is becoming controversial. Um, what do we do when large segments of the population begin to disagree with the inclusion of a right in, in the Bill of Rights? Mm -hmm. If there's a large enough portion, you amend the Constitution. What, in what portion is that going to be? 
three fourths of the states. Yeah, it's uh, two thirds of the Congress and three quarters of the states. Very difficult. Very difficult. What else are we going to do? Are we going to ignore them? Do we want the courts to sort of pretend that they're not there? What do we do? And by the way, guns, uh, we might, there's a very serious argument with, which you know, we could spend lots of time on about you know, whether the Second Amendment really means individual rights. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily uh, assuming that the court gets, got that one right, but if they did get it right, you know, it's, uh, it's embedded in the Constitution, and, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, so, uh, then implicit in our conversation have been criteria. What is, you know, what things should we include and what things shouldn't? What are the criteria for doing that? Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think one of the, I guess, first principles criteria you would think about is, do you retain enough rights to, you know, like write a new constitution if you wanted to? For example, if you have one election, <laughs> you elect a dictator, and then, oh, it turns out that's what you're stuck with, maybe that's not the best idea. And, and we have made, our constitution is exceptionally difficult in comparative terms, looking at it in comparison to other constitutions, exceptionally difficult to uh, to amend. Maybe that's what we. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe we ought to amend that and make it easier. But maybe not. You know, I just. I mean, this is a, a question. I think we all ought to ask ourselves: Is how committed are we to the idea of a constitution that is un, impervious to political? Uh, wins, uh, and well, mm -hmm. I was more talking about you know you need freedom of speech, freedom of assembly in order to even begin a process if you uh, wanted to change the constitution or replace the constitution. And so there's if you look back to the list, many of these rights are essential if you're going to have a, demo a democracy at all. So we were talking about the relation between structure and rights, but this is another way in which the two things are so tied together. How could we have a democracy without freedom of speech? Um, now, what about some of the others? I would say you can't have a liberal democracy without freedom of religion as well. That, I think, is maybe, a, I, that would require a longer conversation. But I think that that is true. Uh, I think you can't really have a democracy without security of property. Because if the government is able to take everybody's property, if it controls all the means of production and so forth, uh, the opportunities for freedom are not so good. Uh, we, freedom exists in, a, in, a, in the more pluralistic space of, of the private market, in my opinion. And you know, when I go into the post office, uh, I do not feel like a free person. I feel like I'm being subjected to the bureaucracy. Right? Uh, I, I want less post office and more, uh, you know, more farmers markets, um, and and not maybe not all of these, but a lot of, if putting aside the the criminal procedure protections, which have I think a different thing, a lot of them have to do with protecting the ability to have a democracy. By the way, this was the original thing about guns, too. It wasn't actually about the Second Amendment. Is not about. It may mean individual gun rights, but it's not about hunting and self-defense. It is about having militias, which are organized units at the state level, large enough and powerful enough that they can withstand a federal attack if Caesar were to come along. And remember, from, from Brut Brutus is not the only one who's worried about a Caesar. Right? Uh, one of the popular 
proposals for the Bill of, for a change in the Constitution was to forbid the commander in chief from commanding the troops in person. Isn't that an interesting idea? I'm not all that worried about Donald Trump getting into the, you know, his, his uh, out into the field, but uh, um, but uh, you can see why one might worry because if the president actually has the the person who's the commander of the troops has the personal loyalty, think about a Napoleon too, or or a Caesar, uh, and any it, but. Our system at the beginning, it was impossible for the president to become a Caesar because the state militias uh, were much more powerful than the army. Under Washington, the army never got larger than 1,000 men. There were somewhere between 400,000 and 700,000, depending on how you count them, armed, trained members of the state militias. There can be no Caesar under those circumstances. That's what the Second Amendment is really about originally. And that was preserved. They believe that was preservative of democracy because it was a prevention against a militaristic uh, uh, national takeover. So even the Second Amendment has this story about you know, why it's necessary for, uh, for democracy. Um, one last point. In fact, I'm not going to make a last point because time is about up. <laughs>